And John Sawad used to say that if you're meditating and you want to see the First Noble Truth, you don't have to look very far. Wherever there's a disturbance in the mind, wherever the mind is not still, take that as an example of the First Noble Truth, a truth of stress. Now, if the mind is full of disturbances, you know, it's going to be pretty muddy. It's not going to be clear. This is one of the reasons why we try to make the mind as still as possible, so things can begin to separate out. The Buddha talks about this. He talks about emptiness as a dwelling. We hear a lot about emptiness as an attribute of, of things, attribute of the six senses. And the Buddha talks about it as an attribute of the six senses, too. And in that context, it means empty of self, your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, even your mind. It should be seen as not self, empty of self. But then there's emptiness as a dwelling. The Buddha once said that he dwelled in emptiness. And in that case, emptiness meant something different, empty of disturbance. What this requires is you get the mind in a quiet place and appreciate the fact that it is empty of the disturbances that would be there if you were in a noisy place. You come out here to the monastery, you're away from the issues of your family, away from issues of society, and learn how to appreciate that. But then being here, there are still the disturbances here. So try to bring the mind to concentration. Get it focused on one thing, like the breath. And as the formula for mindfulness says, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. All those disturbances related to the world right now, you can put them aside. They yell at you at how important they are. Remember, the Buddhist perspective is that what you're doing, how you're handling your mind in the present moment, that's more important. So really focus in here. And after a while, the issues of the world will begin to go far away. Learn how to appreciate that. Less disturbance in the mind. But there is still some disturbance. There's the directed thought and the evaluation. And for a while you can't let them go. You have to put up with that disturbance, because you're trying to fit the mind together with its object, the breath, and make the most of it, the breath to give rise to a sense of well-being and ease. This is an important lesson in the practice. You don't let go of things just wholesale, and you realize what you've got to hold on to in order to let go skillfully. This is why the Buddha outlines the different stages of concentration through the jhanas. Sometimes you hear the forest of jhanas saying that jhana is not necessary, but what they're talking about is the jhana of the, the commentaries, the jhana of the Visuddhimagga, which is an intense trance-like state where there's no thinking, no awareness even of your six senses, well, five senses, you're still aware of the mind. But it's so intense that there's no ability to step back and contemplate it. We have to remember that the Buddha's main explanation of how you get to know the Dharma is through committing to the practice and then reflecting on it. And emptiness as a dwelling requires that you be able to reflect. And that's the kind of concentration that all the Ajahns teach. You get the mind really, really still, and then you pull out a little bit and watch the mind in its stillness and ask yourself, what disturbance is still there? As you're getting the mind into concentration, the first thing you're letting go of is unskillful mental states. And there's a sense of ease, even a sense of rapture, the Buddha says, that comes from being secluded from those states. As you're thinking about and adjusting the breath, 
totally absorbed in what you're doing right here. And they get to the point where everything is really balanced. And you can let go of the direct thought and evaluation, and the mind stays. And John Fuang's image is of casting something in concrete. As long as the concrete hasn't set yet, you don't take away the forms. But once it has set, you can take away the forms and the concrete stays right where it is. Learn how to appreciate that. Your mind is now empty of attractive thought and evaluation. But there's still some disturbance. A sense of rapture can sometimes get too intense. So you go through the different levels, allowing these different fabrications in the mind, these different perceptions to change and peel away. And each time you do that, you try to stay settled in it for a while. Because as you get the mind more and more still, each time you come to a level of stillness where you've never been before, it seems really wide open, light, totally undisturbed. Well, watch it carefully. Stay there. As your sensitivities adjust, you begin to sense disturbances you hadn't seen before. This is why it's good to do this step by step by step. Because otherwise the disturbances are like a paper covered with scribbles. You can't read anything, because everything is all scribbled over everything else. But if you take one layer of scribbling away, and one layer away, one layer away, you begin to see things a lot more clearly. You begin to see different levels of stress. And you can see what you're doing to cause them. When you can see that, you let them go. So in this way you're getting into concentration at the same time you're, practice, you're exercising your discernment. You've got calm, tranquility on the one hand, and you've got insight developing on the other. They work together like this. So the important thing is, if you want to see subtle levels of disturbance in the mind, subtle levels where the first noble truth is still playing out, of course there's going to be the second noble truth playing out as well, you've got to get it as still and as undisturbed as possible. And appreciate that lack of disturbance. That's what the emptiness is all about, is emptiness is a dwelling. Because one of the hard parts of the practice is learning to appreciate the idea of total unbinding, total release as something really good. A lot of people are scared of it. But as you learn how to appreciate the undisturbed mind, the extent to which you can make it undisturbed, your mind inclines more and more to looking for even greater levels of being undisturbed. And that's the kind of emptiness that's really valuable. Ultimately, the Buddha said his level of an emptiness dwelling was undisturbed of, by passion, undisturbed by aversion, undisturbed by delusion. That's the direction in which we're headed. And as you learn how to appreciate, lack of disturbance in the mind is a really good thing. You'll be more and more inclined to want to go in that direction. This is how you dwell in emptiness. And you want to make it a place where you really do feel comfortable dwelling. So you approach it step by step like this. And John Lee's images of throwing a rock in a smelter. And as you raise the temperature, the different metals separate out. First the tin separates out, then the lead, then the silver, then the gold. In the same way, as the mind gets more and more still, the different levels of fabrication fall away. Verbal fabrication falls away. 
as you enter the second jhana. Bodily fabrication, the in and out breath, that falls away as you enter the fourth. If you start going into the formless jhanas and the different levels of perception, the perception of space is more gross than the perception of consciousness. The perception of consciousness is more gross than the perception of nothingness. If you can see them separate out one by one like that, that's how this dwelling in emptiness leads both to calm and insight at the same time. That's how you learn how to appreciate the direction in which we're going.